All right. Uh, so welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome, Vinod, uh, for this uh, TCS Plus. So it's a pleasure to have all of you here. So before I introduce the speaker, let me maybe go around the table and uh, say hi to, um, to everyone. So uh, we have a group uh, led by Clément from um, joining us from Stanford uh, University. Uh, welcome, guys. Uh, then there's a group uh, with Kupien from uh, University of, uh, of Michigan. Uh, welcome. Uh, then we have uh, Esan joining us from uh, USC. Uh, welcome, guys. Um, then there's um, Eric uh, from Colombia. Uh, hi. Uh, Kay, I recognize. Gopala Krishnan, hi. Um, welcome, as usual. Um, and then there's a group led by Sayed from uh, BSU. Uh, welcome, guys. Um, Travas is joining us from NYU. Um, and Janish is joining us from Caltech. Um, and Vinod is joining us from MIT, I presume. Um, yeah. So uh, welcome, everyone. So um, let's get started before I start. So uh, I'll remind you that the so we shifted the schedule a little bit uh, due to Thanksgiving. So there's no talk uh, next week. And then the week after that, uh, we'll have kind of a slightly special talk. Uh, so John Kellner will give a talk, and the talk will be dedicated to the to the memory of Michael uh, Cohen. Uh, so that's a couple of weeks from now. Today, we're very, very happy uh, to have uh, Vinod Vaikuntanathan uh, give the talk. So um, Vinod is now a professor at MIT. Uh, he got his PhD from MIT, advised by Shafi Goldwasser. Uh, but after that, he spent some time at uh, University of Toronto. Uh, he's now a professor at MIT. So Vinod's uh, famous for too many things that I'm not going to try to go over them. Um, maybe um, um, a lot uh, his work on uh, homomorphic encryption, um, but many, many other things across uh, cryptography. So it's, it's really a pleasure to have him uh, talk today. Um, and so um, Vinod, uh, welcome. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Dama. Um And uh, thank you. And uh, thanks to G and India and the TCS Plus team, everyone in the TCS Plus team, to, uh, for having me over. Um, uh, it's a great pleasure to talk. It's a little bit of an unusual mode for me. This is actually the first time I'm speaking to people that I, I can see, surprisingly. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, too many people. Um, so, um, so uh, you know, my talk is about um, the problem of program obfuscation, which is... Um, um, which is a, sort of a hot topic in cryptography. Um, I'll convince you for a good reason. Um, and the connection of program obfuscation to random constraint satisfaction problems. Um, and I'll convince you that uh, sort of, you know, um, at first sight, there doesn't seem to be a sort of a relationship between these two uh, topics, but they are very deeply and uh, sort of seemingly inherently related. Um, so this is um, a few results based on joint works with Rachel Lynn uh, from uh, Santa Barbara and uh, Alex Lombardi, who's a student here. Um, and uh, I have to say that uh, many of these slides are stolen from Alex Lombardi and Omer Panet. Uh, if there's anything good about the slides, I'll take credit for it. And uh, if the slides don't look good, you, have to, you can blame them. It's supposed to be the other way around, right? Uh, but uh, never mind. Um, all right, so, so let's get started. So, uh, so this talk is about uh, two worlds. Um, uh, the first world is the world of program obfuscation, which I'll describe. Uh, and the second world is, uh, is one of uh, random constraint satisfaction problems. So let's get started with the first world. Um, so program obfuscation, obfuscation is a big word. Um, so if you don't understand it, you go to uh, uh, the Webster dictionary and see what that means. Uh, obfuscation is, uh, is, a, is an action of uh, making something uh, obscure, unclear, unintelligible. And for programs, what that means is, uh, is, a, is, a, is an action of taking a program and converting it into another program or a circuit into another circuit or a Turing machine into another Turing machine in a way that, um, you know, the, the resulting, the output of this process is, um, it looks completely like gibberish, but still it's a program. You can run it. You can run it on inputs. You get the outputs that you expect. That's what program obfuscation does in words. Um, so let me sort of start with a puzzle, right? So, so here is a program, I claim. <laughs> um, can everyone see what uh, what the slides are showing? Yes. Well, the resolution oh, is not fantastic. So. Uh. <laughs> okay. Well, that's part of obfuscation, I suppose. Um, hmm. uh, let me see. Um, uh, the resolution of the text was clear, right? Oh yeah, yeah. This? Actually, it, it's actually okay. If I sorry, this was me. Um, no, it, we can actually read what's written on the plane, so it's fine. Good. Okay. All right. That's even better. So, so, so here's the question: What does the 
this is a program I claim. This is actually a valid kosher C program. Uh, what does it do? Okay. I'm not going to sort of request answers from you guys, but, uh, but really, let me tell you the answer. Uh, it is a flight simulator, turns out. So this program, if you run it, it actually does, it actually brings up like a picture and does a flight simulator. Here is another program. Any guesses <laughs> on the chat? <laughs> um, turns out that this program actually approximates the value of pi by looking at its own surface area. Um, so, you know, these are really, you know, this is, there is an art of kind of writing obfuscated programs. So both of these programs were uh, taken from the IO C contest in the International Obfuscated C Code Contest, and they were winners in, uh, in two years. Right, so these are really like programs. You look at them, you have, uh, you don't have an idea of what they do. Maybe the first one you, you can guess, but not the second one. Uh, but in any case, you can, if, you, if, you, if you're impatient, right, um, you can cheat with these programs. You can actually run these programs. These are actual programs. You can run them, you can see what they do, and that actually spills the beans in some sense with these two programs. Okay. Um, the kind of programs that, uh, that we want to obfuscate in cryptography are different from these programs. These are programs with secrets in their head. Um, so what are secrets? Well, I'm a cryptographer, so cryptographic keys are a natural example of a secret. Um, so here is an example of uh, the kind of thing I want to do. Let's say, you know, um, I am Alice. Uh, I wanna, I'm going on vacation, and I want to delegate um, um, uh, sort of my email, reading a subset of my emails uh, to my admin. So let's say all emails that uh, um, start with, um, you know, that have like IST or MIT in them. Um, it's something that I want to delegate. So what would I do? Here's an example of what I can do. I can write a program that says that takes an encrypted email as input. Uh, it has a secret key in its head. It's sort of, you know, the first line of the program is the hard-coded secret key. Uh, you decrypt, the program decrypts the encrypted message. It checks if there is a special string in the message. If yes, it returns a message. Otherwise, it says, uh, you know what, tough luck, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to answer. Sorry, this email is private. Yes. So this is a program I write. I can ship it over to my admin, but obviously the problem is that uh, the, the, the program has a secret key hard coded. So if she, if he looks at the program, he can read the secret key out and that's it. You know, there's no sort of delegation anymore. So what I really want to do is I want to obfuscate this program. Um, send it over to my admin. So now he can run this program on inputs and produce outputs. In other words, he can use this to read all emails that have IST in its, uh, as a substring, but he won't be able to do anything more. In particular, he won't be able to recover the secret key by looking at this program. So that's what I want to do. This is an application uh, that I want to realize using program obfuscation. Okay. So what are other kinds of secrets? I mean, you can imagine sort of licensing information in digital rights management. Uh, you can imagine sort of even sort of a devious use of program obfuscation and putting in backdoors, which are sort of undetectable by running the, the, the program, but they get activated on a special input. Or sometimes even the algorithm itself is protected information, right? I came up with a, with a clever algorithm to do, to solve vertex cover. Uh, I can dream. Um, and I want to sort of code it up, and I want to sell it to you. Yes, I mean, I don't want you to kind of reverse engineer it and make my quadratic time algorithm into a linear time algorithm. Right? So that's what I want to do. Um, so this is program obfuscation. Um, what I'm more excited about, um, I am a theorist. I'm more excited about sort of applications of obfuscation in cryptography. I mean, what can obfuscation do? Where does obfuscation fit into the cryptographic landscape? So it turns out that. Obfuscation is, is a crypto-complete uh, primitive in the sense that you know, any cryptographic task that you, that you imagined in the past uh, and anything that you will imagine in the next 10 years, um, uh, you can probably realize it as an easy corollary of program obfuscation. So I'm just being a little, little facetious here, but, uh, but the power of program obfuscation is such that it can sort of realize a wide variety of cryptographic tasks, some which we knew was possible and some which we didn't. Just to give you an example, um, program obfuscation is not a sort of a new quest. In fact, if you go back and look at the 1976 paper of Diffie and Hellman, which started cryptography, started public key cryptography, um, the way, the first way they kind of thought about getting a public key encryption scheme is to take a secret key encryption scheme where, you know, 
both encryption and decryption need the same secret keys. It's also called a symmetric encryption for the same reason. Uh, you want to take that and make it into a public encryption scheme where the encryption can be performed by anyone using a public key, but the decryption needs the secret key to, to do. Right. So this is what you. So you know the the the, the big bang of cryptography was in constructing wasn't realizing that public encryption was possible. Uh, and the way Diffie and Hellman thought about it, if you go back, there is a little kind of uh, like one paragraph in their paper where they sort of ponder this possibility of taking the encryption algorithm of a secret key encryption scheme, which actually needs a secret key, right? So it's a program that has a secret key in it, um, obfuscating it and publishing it for everyone to use, right? So if you obfuscate properly, then you know this obfuscated program acts as a public key. It doesn't reveal any information about the secret key, and you can use it to encrypt. Perfect, right? They unfortunately kind of moved on after this paragraph to do other things, um, but but already sort of the quest to do program obfuscation started in 1970s. So you might say public encryption. What's a big deal? You know, we know like you know five different public encryption schemes now. Why are you telling me this uh, this fact? One, because of its historical importance. And secondly, because things don't stop there. There is this thing called fully homomorphic encryption, which uh, if you haven't seen it, it's a, it's a very powerful object which lets you take encryption, ciphertext, encryptions of x and y, and compute lets you compute encryption of x plus y, or an encryption of x times y, without actually knowing what x and y are. So it's sort of like computing under the hood. right? So this actually was open for a very long time, from the 1970s until 2000s. And you know what? If you have a way to obfuscate programs, here's a completely trivial way to, uh, to do uh, fully homomorphic encryption. So I'm going to take this uh, little program, this four line program, which takes two inputs, two ciphertext as inputs, C1 and C2, and an operation. Let's say it's a binary operation, you know, plus or times, decrypts the two ciphertexts, does the operation on them, and encrypts it and returns the result. OK, so this is a program that I can use to compute on encryptions. But if I obfuscate it properly, I, it doesn't reveal the secret key. So again, two-liner. You, know, uh, you know, if you have obfuscation, you can get this. So things don't stop there. You know, this is a laundry list of a long, long sequence of, uh, sort of things that, uh, that you can do from, uh, from program obfuscation. In fact, you can use program obfuscation to derive sort of complexity theoretic corollaries. For example, you can construct games um, where sort of computing the Nash is, uh, is hard, even its average case hard. It's even sub-exponentially hard, so on and so forth. So there's a long series of work that uh, use program obfuscation for various purposes. So it's really a sort of a holy grail of, uh, of cryptography in some sense. Sorry, quick question. Sorry, quick so, um, question. I think, yes. um, I think you, you haven't made the distinction between distinction. BBB and IO yet. So, IO yet. so all these follow Thomas, up IO? Tom, uh -huh. Thomas, uh, click. Um, here is where I make the distinction. So there is a little bit of a, what Thomas is pointing out is that there is a little wrinkle in the fantastical story that I made up, which is that all these applications, all these sort of two-liners that I described, follow from a very strong notion of obfuscation called virtual black box obfuscation. I'm not really going to define it, but you know, it is a formalization of the English statement that you can, you know, this obfuscated program should be sort of executable, but it shouldn't reveal absolutely anything besides sort of input output behavior. Right? So one can formalize it. Unfortunately, it turns out that this is impossible. In the sense you can come up with like programs, even sort of natural looking programs, which cannot be obfuscated in the virtual black box sense. So this is a result of Barack uh, uh, and colleagues. But things don't seem that bad. So, so at this point, you might ask, well, why did you tell me all these things if, uh, if program obfuscation is impossible? What it turns out is that you can, um, what seems to be achievable, is a weaker notion of obfuscation called indistinguishability obfuscation. I'm, again, not going to define it because it's not the point of this. Uh, I'm not going to sort of use it in this talk. But just think of it as a weaker notion of obfuscation. Uh, and it has three properties. Um, number one, there are no impossibility results. There are no sort of Barak type impossibility results for indistinguishability obfuscation. Two, in fact, we even have candidate constructions of indistinguishability obfuscation. In fact, sort of from weaker and weaker assumptions, that's actually the rest of this talk. Uh, and number three, you know, getting all these, you can recover all these applications that I mentioned um, from this weaker notion of obfuscation. Um, it's not a two-liner anymore. It actually, you know, you, you put in your sweat and blood uh, and I.O. and uh, out comes all these applications. Okay, but it turns out this can be done. And we have a pretty good understanding of how to recover um, sort of these applications using this weaker um, notion. 
Okay, so, so that's the story. That's the obfuscation world. That's where we are. Let's move to the second world, apparently completely different world of random constraint satisfaction problems. Okay, so what are these? Um, I'll describe this in the language of local pseudo-random generators, and, and, and here they are. This is an object defined by Odette Goldreich in uh, 2000. Um, and here's what it is. So this is a, a function, uh, a local pseudo-random generator is a, is a function um, that takes n bits of input and produces m bits. Because it's a pseudo-random generator, m should be bigger than n. It should expand its input. Uh, in this picture, you should really, so the, the top, the red, is the input layer, and the bottom is the output layer. Um, this pseudo-random generator is defined by two objects. One is this bipartite hypergraph. So this you can see in the picture, right? Each output is connected to L input bits in sort of a directed fashion. So it's a directed uh, L plus one uniform hypergraph, if you will. That's number one. Number two um, is a predicate P that takes L bits of input and produces one bit of output. Yeah, so that's, that's, that, that defines the surround generator. Well, fair enough. So how do you compute this uh, surround generator? You take X as input, X1 of XN, N bits as input. For each output bit, you know that it's connected to L input bits. That's what the hyper edge tells you to do. So go look up these input bits, apply the predicate P on them, and that gives you uh, the first output bit. And of course, you can keep doing it for each output bit independently, and that gives you the output of the pseudorandom generator. And of course, security says that if I evaluate this function on a random n bit input, you cannot, a polynomial time adversary cannot distinguish between that and a completely random m bit string. That's what pseudorandomness is. So that's a local pseudo-random generator, right? So this is going to be the key character in uh, in our in our in our in our discussion. So if you have any questions, you know, just feel free to interrupt uh, and ask. Okay. Let me actually slightly generalize uh, uh, the local PRG notion uh, to a blockwise local PRG, which is nothing but uh, you know just the same function, except I'm, my input is not going to be bits. I'm going to treat it as uh, coming from some alphabet of size q. Right, that's the only difference uh, between the previous slide and, uh, and this slide. Right, that's it. So you still have a predicate, except it takes uh, L symbols from the alphabet q and output still outputs one bit. Good, so this is a blockwise local PRG. Um, and of course, you know, I have to say that you know, there's no restriction that each output bit is computed using the same predicate. You could actually use like different predicates, but I don't want to complicate life, so I'm just going to talk about this uh, um, this notion for, for now on. Okay, so this is a local PRG uh, world, um, and uh, the questions here, the kind of questions we ask in these worlds are question in the program obfuscation world, can we construct indistinguishability obfuscation from standard cryptographic assumptions? Let's say the hardness of factoring, the hardness of finding short vectors and lattices, so on and so forth. And that's the big sort of million dollar, well, I don't know about a million dollar, but a lot, you know, a, a million intellectual dollars worth of, uh, uh, worth of question. Um, well, number two, the kind of questions you ask is, you know, I want to get sort of random generators, and in the process, how simple can I make these predicates? Like, can I make these predicates look at, like, one input bit? Well, that's impossible. Two, three, four, like, how small can I actually make this? That's the kind of question you, um, you ask in the CSP world, in the PRG world. And these questions turn out to be extremely, sort of, you know, inherently, sort of deeply connected to each other. Okay. And here is the connection between uh, local PRGs and indistinguishability obfuscation in one slide, um, summarized. Um, there is, there's been a chain of sort of, uh, uh, sort of long chain of works that, uh, that, that construct obfuscation, um, I.O. is indistinguishability obfuscation, um, from weaker and weaker and weaker primitives. So the first in this line of work is, uh, is a work um, uh, by Nir Bidansky and myself and uh, Prabhanjan Anant and uh, Abhishek Jain, who say that if you have something called functional encryption for NC1 circuits, NC1 is log depth circuits, functional encryption I'll define in a minute, don't worry, but it's an object, it's a cryptographic object. If you have that, we say you can sort of upgrade it somehow to obfuscation. The second line of work will be said, well, where does functional encryption for NC1 come from? We don't know. We said if you have functional encryption for NC0, which is constant depth circuits, 
uh, where in, in, in particular, each output bit depends only on a constant number of input bits. If you have that, then you can upgrade that all the way to NC1. OK, where does functional encryption for NC0 come from? <laughs> then we said, well, if you have these objects called constant degree multilinear maps, again, I'm going to define it. Don't worry. Uh, you can construct functional encryption for NC0. So you have this really long chain of uh, so reductions that construct obfuscation from weaker and weaker and weaker primitives, hopefully at some point trying to reach something that we actually know how to construct, how to instantiate. That's a hope. Okay, so where does local PRGs fit into this picture? Nowhere in the slide, right? I mean, you don't see in the slide. I don't see it, certainly. It turns out that um, one of these steps, in particular the middle step of going from functional encryption for constant depth circuits to logarithmic depth circuits, needs um, a local uh, local PRG. Okay, so this is the this is a big picture um, of where we are with IO. Uh, a concrete instantiation of this big picture is uh, okay, so never mind. A concrete instantiation of this big picture is a uh, is a theorem of uh, Rachel Lynn from crypto this year. She's already sort of a result of a you know end of the line in a sequence of works. And what she says is that I can construct an obfuscation scheme assuming three things. One, L linear maps. So these are degree L multilinear maps, which again I'll define in just a minute once I finish stating the theorem. Uh, number one. Number two, locality L PRGs. See that the L and the L, they are the same L. You know, it's not an accident, right? That the locality and the linearity of the multilinear maps match. Yeah, so locality LPRGs with polynomial stretch, like n to the 1 plus epsilon stretch, n bits to n to the 1 plus epsilon bits. And something called learning with errors. But you know what? It is the small kid in the block. You know, we all somewhat somehow believe this assumption, so I'm going to ignore this from now on. So really, the A and B are the characters in the game. OK, so this is a theorem. So now, given this theorem, you can ask, are we done? Do we have the holy grail? <laughs> I mean, of course, the theorem says there exists an I.O. scheme. Uh, Assuming A and B. So the question is, can I assume A and B? And do A and B exist? All right. And so, oh, so sorry, let me tell you. Oh, um, yes. Just the L. Can you say how the L yes. relates to the other parameters? So is L a constant there, or no? It's something that's scale. L. You should think about it as a constant. You should think about it as a constant. Okay. Good. Uh, great question. Um, let me say that constructing um, L linear maps gets harder and harder as L increases. And con constructing locality LPRGs gets easier and easier as L increases. So there is a sort of a tension between these two objects. And, uh, and you know, uh, we want to find, find a point where both exist. Right? Okay. Does that answer? Yeah, what is answers. SXDH? Yeah. Good, good question. So Clama asks, what is SXDH? Never mind. You know, it's, it's a variant of the Diffie-Hellman assumption. The details are unimportant for us. Just, it's a Diffie-Hellman assumption. It's, a, it's, again, one of the small kids in the block. Right. Really, the question is, can I actually construct these uh, L linear maps, which I'll define again in a minute. Okay. So again, this is the theorem. This is a theorem. This is a theorem. Now we can ask, what good is this theorem? Can I instantiate it with A and B? Good. Any other questions uh, about the theorem before, before we move on? Good? OK. Let's see what, uh, what good is this theorem. And before doing that, I want to go back to my previous slide where I showed this chain of reductions. And I used, I threw around various terms without actually defining any of them. Uh, let me actually define uh, two of these terms, and then we'll make sense of We'll sort of dive deeper into Lenz theorem. Okay, functional encryption. What is functional encryption? You know, I didn't want to sort of write down a complicated cryptographic definition, so I wrote a, you know, uh, this is my approximation of a haiku. Um, so here is a functional encryption. Given an encryption of a string x and secret key for a function f, you should be able to compute f of x, but nothing else. In particular, no other information about x should be revealed. And PS, an important PS, is that the size of the encryption of x shouldn't really blow up. In particular, you shouldn't be able to, like, you shouldn't enumerate all possible functions uh, and uh, encrypt each result in the in the ciphertext. That's kind of cheating. So I want the encryption of x 
to grow proportional to the bit length of x. So proportional, so it grow linearly with the bit length of x. Yeah, so that's functional encryption. Yeah, so is that, I'm yeah, hiding so, many, many, many details. F here is public, right? It's not, you're not trying to F here is public. About F. I'm not trying to hide F. I am trying to hide X, uh, but I am willing to reveal F of X. To you, you are the person with the secret key for the function F. Yeah? Fair enough? Good. All right, so this is functional encryption. What are these multilinear maps? Well, let's start from one. Okay, uh, what is a one linear map? You know, it's really a group G uh, where, you know, I can compute, given X, I can compute G to the power X. You know, this is exponentiation. G is a generator, given X, I can compute G to the X. And because it's a group, if I multiply G to the X and G to the Y, I'm thinking of this as a multiplicative group, I get G to the power X plus Y. Yeah, that's what, that's what groups do. This is just a group operation. But the Diffie-Hellman assumption says that given g to the x and g to the y, it's hard to compute, it's computationally hard to come up with g to the power x times y. In other words, given g to the x, g to the y, g to the z, and so on and so forth, you can compute linear functions in the exponent, that's why it's one linear, but computing quadratic functions is hard. That's what, uh, that's what this is. Right, and this can be instantiated. We believe the Diffie-Hellman assumption when you instantiate the group with, uh, uh, you know, z mod p z star, you know, the group of numbers mod mod p. Right. So this we believe from the 1970s. Well, if we can do one, you should be able to do two, right? Uh, so what is a two-linear map? You want not one but two groups, um, and I should be able to take g to the x and g to the y, and I. Oh, and apply some operation on them. It's not group multiplication anymore, it's some other operation. I should be able to get g to the power x, y. I should be able to compute quadratic functions in the exponent, but I should not be able to compute degree three functions. Right? That's bilinear maps. It's two linear maps. And this we know from the work of uh, Antoine Joux and uh, uh, Bonnet and uh, Franklin, uh, the Godel Prize winning work um, from uh, the early 2000s. So I have a question here. Uh, which is, am I correct in thinking that LWE is not good for constructing I.O.? Um, that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, LWE is not sufficient at this point for constructing I.O. I do not know a construction of I.O. from LWE, from the hardness of learning with errors alone. And that's a, uh, um, that's a long, open question. And uh, many of us have put money, crowdsourced money towards a solution. If you solve it, you'll get 100 bucks from me. Um, and I hope, you know, I hope uh, this is not, um, I hope Amit, Amit is not listening. Amit Sahai is not listening. He offered 100 bucks for it. I have, several of us have offered 100 bucks for the answer to this question. Okay, so good luck. I mean, uh, you know, I, 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 I do suggest people sort of think about this. All right, okay, good. So let's, let's sort of go back to, to our game. So one linear map, we know. Two linear map, we know. Thanks to Dan, yeah. Hey, if you can do one and two, you should be able to do three, right? Uh, what's the big deal? Again, I want sort of groups, g and g prime, where given g to the x, g to the x, g to the y, g to the z, I should be able to compute degree three monomials in the exponent, but I should not be able to compute degree four monomials. That's a three linear map. And this we don't know. This is a long open question, open for 20, 25 years, whether these things actually exist. And we have no clue, really. We, uh, no negative, positive, nothing. Okay, so that's multilinear maps for you. Okay, so now let's, we have the machinery to dive a bit deeper into the Lin theorem. And, uh, and I'm gonna sort of decompose it into two lemmas. Lemma one says that uh, if you have L linear maps, so again, L linear is what we showed. We showed one linear, two linear, three linear. If you have L linear maps for some constant L, then you can construct functional encryption for degree L functions. Remember functional encryption where there was a function F if f is a degree L function and you have L linear maps, you can actually uh, construct a functional encryption scheme for f. That's the first theorem. That's, first, that's the first lemma of, uh, of Rachel. Okay. Lemma two says that if there is a functional encryption for degree L functions and there exists a locality L pseudo-random generator, then you can construct functional encryption scheme for all NC1 functions and therefore you know, bootstrap it all the way to indistinguishability obfuscation. Right? So 
the L linear and the locality L are in our sort of very tied to each other. So to apply both these lemmas one after the other, I would start from an L linear map. I would get a functional encryption scheme for degree L functions. And then I would apply lemma two together with the locality L pseudo random generator to get uh, obfuscation. Right? So that's what uh, Lynn's theorem says. Good. OK, great. So I'm not going to be able to prove both these lemmas. Each of them is a, is a one hour talk. Sorry. This, I usually. I usually never get calls. This is the opportune time that I'm getting. Uh... Sorry, sorry. Um, um, someone, someone is calling me. Precisely, precisely this time. Like, 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 get one call on call on Um, I, I, um, um. um your sound got messed up. Um, maybe it's interference from the phone or something. Maybe. Uh, can you hear me now? No? I can hear you, but there's a lot of noise on the line. Um, it's like this for everyone. Uh, it, or? Can anyone sort of uh, write in the it got, window? It, you it got better. It got better. Uh, OK. OK, I think it's OK now. Sorry. Yeah. OK, good. So I'm going to say, uh, OK, good. Hope this won't happen um, again. Um, OK, good. So we have lemma 1 and lemma 2, yes? So let's sort of quickly, one, in one slide, see a proof of lemma 1 and a proof of lemma 2. Um, OK, good. So let me change the slides. Good. Good. OK, so lemma 1, you want to construct a functional encryption scheme for degree L functions assuming L linear maps. So this is a beautiful slide. Uh, because everything I'm going to say below the proof is just plain false. Um, but you know, hopefully, it'll give you a flavor of uh, how these two things are connected. OK, proof. OK, so how do I encrypt a x? x is a, as a, as a string of uh, bits, actually, x1 up to xn. I'm going to encrypt it as g to the power x1, g to the power x2 up to g to the power xn. What is g? g is a generator of the group, the, so the group guaranteed by the linear maps. Okay. This already, if you're a cryptographer, you should sort of you know, raise uh, alarm bells because x1 is a bit. If I give you g to the x1, you know what it is. It's either g to the 0 or g to the 1, yes? So not so good. But you know, flow with me. <laughs> so let's sort of keep going along these lines. Um, um, so what do I want? I want? Given the secret key for a function f, I want to compute degree l functions in the exponent, right? So I get, get g to the x1 up to g to the xn, and I want to compute degree l functions of x1 up to xn. That's what, I, that's what you asked me to do. Function f is a degree l function. So it seems like l linear maps are necessary. You should be able to compute degree l functions, so you need l linear maps. Yes? What the chain of works uh, you know, uh, showed, you know, the, the long line of works showed is that OFL linear maps are sufficient. In other words, some constant times L linear maps are sufficient. Uh, in fact, before Rachel's work, it was three times L plus two, or something like that. Uh, and Rachel actually shows that, shows that this is actually tight. Not only are L linear maps necessary to construct functional encryption for, um, uh, for, NC, for, for degree L functions, they're also sufficient. She shows the construction. Yeah, does that make sense? Good. So when you write necessary, this is assuming that encryption is has this form of encryption that you took. But is, is there a more general necessity result? There, there is. There, there's not a proof that uh, you need okay. uh, sort of linear maps. This is sort of a uh, um, uh, an intuitive sort of necessary. Uh, so, so there is an open question of can you show that uh, if you have black box access to a group with uh, L linear maps, uh, or rather L minus one linear maps? You cannot do uh, uh, functional encryption. So that's a, that's a formalization of the statement that you said. We don't know of a, such a statement. We don't know of the, the truth of such a statement. This is just a sort of an intuitive. Like if I start kind of writing down in a piece of paper, I say, well, you know, it has to be that way, right? Um, and it wasn't clear though that uh, L linear maps are sufficient to do um, functional encryption. 
precisely because the encryption that I wrote down in the first bullet is not a secure encryption. By far, it's not a secure encryption. So you really have to work much harder uh, to do it. Uh, and, uh, and the surprising thing is that uh, you can actually do all these maneuvering with only a linear map. Good. So I'm not proving anything here, but this is just a sort of a beginning of a flavor of uh, of how this goes. Okay, good. So I declare victory. Um, lemma two is what is it? It's a it's a way to bootstrap functional encryption. It's a way to go from functional encryption for um, NC zero. So let's say degree constant degree functions, actually constant locality functions. Um, Together with a constant locality PRG, locality LPRG, uh, two functional encryption for NC1 functions, logarithmic depth uh, circuits. Okay, again, this is going to be a proof in quotes. I'm not really going to prove it, but hopefully it'll give you a flavor of uh, what I'm talking about. Good. So the construction going from NC0 to NC1 crucially uses this tool called uh, randomized encodings. Um, it's a tool that Applebaum, Ishai, and Kushlevitz invented back in 2004 and it's been extremely useful uh, since then. And what it does, roughly speaking, is the following. So um, randomized encodings give you a way to take a function f, which is complicated, func function f that acts on an input x. f is very complicated. Let's say it's an NC1. And come up with another function f hat, which is much simpler. f hat is actually an NC0. But the only thing is that the f hat is a randomized function. So f hat doesn't just take x as input, uh, it takes uh, a random string r as input as well. So what AIK say, what randomized encoding says, is that computing f on x is equivalent to computing f hat of x together with randomness in the following sense. If I give you f hat of x comma r, right, for a randomly chosen r, you can actually recover f of x um, from this information. Um, on the other hand, f hat of x comma r reveals no more information than f of x. In other words, information theoretically, f of x and f hat of x comma r are equivalent. You can go from one to the other. So this is randomized encoding. Uh, so if you want an exercise, um, here is a here is a here is a here is a cute problem. Uh, consider the parity function. Consider f to be the parity function on n bits. So this is a complicated function in the sense that it's not computable in uh, in AC0, right? Turns out that there's a very simple um, randomized encoding for the parity function, f hat for the parity function, uh, which can be computed in NC0. In fact, it can be computed in locality three, looking at three sort of uh, uh, bits of the input and the randomness. So this is an exercise while you're listening to the talk or, or maybe uh, after when you're getting lunch. Uh, but this turns out that this randomized encoding you can do for all functions in NC1. So any complicated function in NC1 can be turned into a simple randomized function f hat in NC0. Okay. So this is uh, something that I think everyone should know. It's beyond. You know, so, so this is a notion that is sort of beyond cryptography, and that's what we. That's a notion we'll use here. So it, okay. It, sorry, yes. the notion is a bit confusing to me. So um, okay, good. Good. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, the way you said it, it seems like you just put f in NC0. So. Um, Mm. So no. f hat of x and r is um, let you compute f of x with high probability over r, or um... uh, no? You can even say you can even think of sort of perfect correctness. So the point is that okay. So so let's think so about it, right? So f of x. Yeah. Good. So f is complicated, right? How would I compute f? Either I compute f, or I compute f hat of x comma r, which is simple, right? And somehow go from f hat of x comma r to f of x. That is a process that is complicated. So somehow I'm splitting the computation of f into two parts. One, I compute f hat of x comma r, which is very, very simple. And given f hat of x comma r, you can recover f, but that is a complicated process. That is actually an NC1 function. OK. But the, so I'm not compressing. But that, but that recovery doesn't involve you needing to know x or anything. Do you need no, to... no, that's crucially the point, right? If I knew x, I would kind of throw this away and compute f of x myself. So here what I'm saying is that I can compute this sort of intermediate representation very, very quickly. From that intermediate representation alone, without x, you can recover the answer. But that, need, that takes time. That takes nc1 time. And the point is that the intermediate representation does not reveal anything beyond f of x. You cannot learn any other information about x. Good. So Clement asks, is r part of the input? r, I think of it as uh, part of the input. 
good. You can only look at O of n bits of R. O of 1 bits of R. Yes, that's right. That's right. So the whole f of f hat considered as a function of x and r is an NC0 function. Right? Sounds magical, but, uh, but really, you know, you can do it. You can do it for NC1. You can, uh, simpler exercises to try to do this for the parity function. Right? Tama, good? Yes, thanks. Good. All right, so this is a magical object that, uh, that we are going to use. So, you know, look, I mean, you know, I have a functional encryption for NC0, right? That's the only thing, the only thing I can use it to, is to compute NC0 functions. How do I compute NC1 functions? Well, I say, instead of encrypting X, right, uh, in, in anticipation of computing uh, an NC1 function, encrypt X comma R. R is just a truly random sequence of bits. So now, instead of generating a secret key for f, you generate a secret key for f hat using the nc0 functional encryption. Put together, you can learn f hat of x comma r. And once you learn that, you can actually run an nc1 process to recover f of x. And by the way, this whole process did not reveal anything more than f of x. That's a randomized encoding guarantee. Right? So you somehow sort of magically reduce the computation of a complicated function, or functional encryption for a complicated function, to functional encryption for a very simple function, nc0. So that's what we are going to do, indeed. So where does local PRG come into picture? So so far, so far, so good, right? I mean, uh, you know, no local, no PRGs at all. The only wrinkle with uh, um, uh, randomized encodings is that the amount of random bits you need is proportional to the circuit size of f. So in some sense, randomized encodings, what they do is they're they're sort of they squash the circuit using randomness into something that is very low depth. Is the number of random bits you need is proportional to the formula size or circuit size of f. And in particular, it could be much more than the length of the input. And remember, you know, our definition of functional encryption, we wanted the size of the encryption of x to be proportional to the bit length of x and doesn't not to depend on anything else. Yeah, so that, that's, that doesn't work. Yeah. Fortunately, there is a very simple solution to this, which is just don't encode all the randomness into um, the encryption of x comma r. Instead, encrypt x together with a seed of a pseudorandom generator, something that is small. And the functional encryption first, sort of the function that you're computing first takes this seed, expands it into r, and then computes f hat on x together with this r. Right? So for this to work, I want the process of going from a seed of a generator, pseudorandom generator, to the output to be an NC0. In particular, the composition of this process together with computing f hat has to be in NC0. So in particular, I need a local PRG to generate R. That's where local PRGs come into picture. Right? Does that make sense? More or less? Good. OK, so this is, this is lemma 1, this is lemma 2. Right? And now we can go back to Lin's theorem and ask, you know, are we done? You know, can we sort of instantiate, um, you know, both A and B somehow and, uh, and, uh, and be done? Well, it turns out that, uh, you know, uh, there's an old result of uh, El Hanan, um, Amir, and Luca that says that uh, you cannot have these locality, small locality pseudorandom generators if you make the locality very small. You cannot. Certainly, you cannot do locality two, which is actually an exercise. Locality three is a harder exercise. Locality four is a slightly more harder exercise. Uh, but you cannot do that. So the best you can get is locality five, so random generators. And we do have constructions, candidate constructions for these locality five PRG. So this construction kind of gets stuck at, uh, at uh, locality five, and therefore needs five linear maps to construct. And as we saw before, we have one linear maps and two linear maps, but we don't have five linear maps. You don't have three, even. right? OK, that's unfortunate. Very soon after Lin's theorem, uh, Lin and Tesaro improved their theorem uh, in the same conference, but uh, you know, they're, <laughs> they're not concurrent, um, uh, to the following theorem, where they relaxed the locality of the PRG that they need. So the theorem is exactly the same as before, L linear maps, same story. You still get an IO scheme. But instead of a Locality LPRG, you only need a blockwise locality LPRG. So 
uh, in other words, you know, you tr uh, PRGs that treat their inputs uh, as coming from a large alphabet. You should really think of it as a logarithmic size alphabet. Rather, um, a polynomial size alphabet, so the description length is uh, logarithmic. And you still want polynomial stretch and so on and so forth. Okay, so that sounds nice. But now the question is, do blockwise locality LPRGs exist? And for how small a block length? Or how small a locality? Well, let's instantiate this two ways. Let's say L equals 3. So then you need three linear maps, and you want blockwise three local PRGs expanding n blocks to enter the 1 plus epsilon bits. Um, and that actually turns out to exist. In the sense, we have candidate constructions for these blockwise three local PRGs, which resist a class of attacks, resist attacks using LPs, SDPs, um, they are epsilon biased, and so on and so forth. So I can't sort of say that they are secure. I mean, like I can't say that factoring is, uh, is hard. But we have tried several attacks, and these guys seem to resist these attacks. So, you know, sounds nice. Sounds better than uh, before. Right. On the other hand, three linear maps, as we saw, we don't have a clue if they exist or not. So, you know, one exists, but the other one doesn't. You know what? This theorem is very general. It works for any L. So I can try to instantiate this with L equals 2. Why not? Right? So this says that there is an I.O. scheme using, which uses bilinear maps, two linear maps, which you can construct from elliptic curves, you know, this Bonnet, Zhu, and uh, Franklin results. And you need a two blockwise local uh, PRG that expands n blocks to something like n times uh, q cubed bits. So the, the exact constants are not super important, but it is sort of super linear number of uh, bits. That's what you want. Okay, so now the tables are turned, if you look at it, right? Bilinear maps exist, but now, you know, do these uh, two blockwise local PRGs exist? We don't know, right? So the onus of existence of I.O. just sort of overnight, it went from whether these linear, three li multilinear maps exist to whether a certain constraint satisfaction problem or a certain uh, local PRG is, uh, is actually secure. Or actually, can you construct a secure instantiation of a certain local PRG? So that's amazing. For a week, you know, uh, we were in this sort of limbo, uh, you know, trying to figure out, you know, does IO exist now, you know? <laughs> and that is suddenly a question about CSPs, which many of us uh, in cryptography, uh, you know, we're not used to sort of thinking about CSPs. So we learned CSPs in, in a week. I mean, by we, I mean Alex learned CSPs in a week. And uh, unfortunately, it turns out um, that uh, um, you can actually come up with polynomial time attacks on these blockwise local PRGs that expand uh, by a sufficient amount, enough to, so any sort of stretch that is sufficient for the lint theorem, we break. So that's a bit of a bummer. So that's the hate part of the love-hate relationship. Um, so, you know, as far as we know, uh, the lint construction is stuck at three linear maps. So the story is a little bit more complicated than that, and hopefully I'll tell you, you know, what that actually means. But this is more or less the high-level picture. So if you're not, um, so if this you're is probably not, silly, but yeah. can you clarify the relationship clarify between uh, being a PRG and this, you're talking about it as a random CSP? I, I think I know what a random CSP is, but Good. Um, um, Good. can you just say Excellent. one sentence? Excellent question. I did, I did plan to say about it. So, um, so there are two differences between, uh, for the CSP folks, there are two differences between sort of, you know, this kind of function being a sort of random generator uh, versus it being uh, sort of a hard CSP. One is, um, uh, well, obviously the difference between worst case and average case, right? So here I actually want sort of the, you know, the, the, the inputs are random somehow. So it's an average case problem. And the second difference is that I'm not asking, you know, the, the kind of question, the PRG question is sort of like a gap CSP question. So in other words, what I'm asking is, am I giving you an m-bit string which actually has a, which, which actually satisfies a CSP? Well, why, why does it satisfy a CSP? Because I constructed it, I planted it, right? Versus a totally random m-bit string which is very far from satisfying the CSP. Right, so it's not, yeah. it's not about deciding whether the random CSP is satisfiable or not. It's, it's, um, no, it's this promise problem of... Right, uh, okay. Exactly. So that, those are the two high-level differences. Uh, there are minor sort of other things that, uh, that are also different, but, uh, you know, 
these are the most significant bits. Yeah. Um, yeah, just another question. So, um, yeah. I mean, I guess because for PRGs, you're sorry. This PRG. Oh, I'm um, sorry. You needed to be secure against against what for your constructions to go through? Like, against um, sub-exponential time uh, adversaries, but doesn't matter. I mean, th this actually that doesn't turn out to matter. Thanks. Yeah. Good. So, in the sense that secure instantiations of these PRGs, for example, three blockwise local PRGs, they actually achieve large stretch even and uh, and these uh, these sort of SDP type attacks. Even if you have like enter the epsilon levels of the sum of squares hierarchy, they don't. They, they seem quite robust in this sub-exponential sense. Good, excellent. So what I want to tell you about is uh, is actually how this attack works. Uh, in the rest of my time. Okay, so so our results. So 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 it turns out that we were not the only ones uh, sort of uh, thinking about this uh, sort of breaking this thing in the span of one week. Uh, Boaz and uh, Zvika and Ilan and Pravesh also have results breaking these uh, blockwise to local uh, uh, PRGs, but in different regimes. So this is a big, huge table of uh, sort of the parameter regimes where our attacks works and their attack works. The high level picture is that, um, you know, is this sort of highlighted sort of uh, uh, row of the table, which is a combination of sort of techniques from our previous, our sort of original work and the BBKK work where we uh, break the PRG for stretch n times q. q is the alphabet length and n is the input length, the number of blocks. Uh, that's actually better than, that's actually less than the amount of stretch that uh, Lynn Tesoro asked for. They asked for n times q cubed. We say, even if you stretch by n times q, we are going to kill it. So even better. One could ask about which predicates our attack works for, and the answer is worst case, and that's actually true across the board. Any predicate doesn't matter what it is. Which graph does it work for? Uh, again, you know, the combination of the two results actually works for worst case graphs. Doesn't matter which graph you're talking about. The only restriction in our result is that um, you know our attack works only if the um, the predicates uh, computing each output bit are the same. You compute each output bit using the same predicate of, uh, of the, so the blocks of the input. That's the only restriction. So the one thing that is open here is can you break the PRG across the board? Can you get the best of all worlds? And that's, that we still don't know. I mean, to, to, to the best of my knowledge, that is still open. Okay. But my point is that it doesn't really matter for the Lintasaro construction because that is already broken by the highlighted, uh, highlighted draw. So that makes sense. Good. And in fact, it even breaks sort of plausible extensions of the Lintasaro theorem. Uh, even if they somehow managed to require less stretch, we, we still sort of managed to break it. One more thing I have to say is that there is some there is an inherent reason why the sort of the Lintasaro type constructions need stretch n times q as opposed to simply stretch omega n. Um, and that's sort of a sort of a you know uh, that's so inherent in the way they sort of uh, um, uh, construct these uh, functional encryption schemes. So any plausible kind of extension of the Lintasaro theorem uh, will get stuck in n times q, and that we already break. Right. So this is actually part of the star story, where I, you know, we don't break all possible sort of instantiations. There is still a very narrow window of opportunity left to kind of use these kind of two CSPs and reduce the amount of stretch that the Lintasaro theorem requires, even below n times q, and hopefully something works there. But it seems very unlikely at this point. Yeah. Okay. So what I want to tell you about is is this attack um, uh, is this highlighted row. Yeah. Any questions about uh, so far um, about this slide? It's a it's a complicated slide, but uh, you know. Really, I mean, you can forget about everything except the uh, highlighted row. Good. Okay, I'm gonna move on. All right. So, so how do we do this attack? Uh, again, you know, uh, my starting point is the Q equals two case. So, in other words, the binary case when the alphabet is actually bits. Well, you know, here are two very simple observations. What can these predicates be? They can either be AND or OR, or unbalanced predicate, in which case the PRG is not secure. I mean, the bits are biased, the output bits are biased, so it's clearly not a sort of a pseudo-random string. 
The only other possible predicates are essentially XOR or variants of XOR. And these are broken by Gaussian elimination. So that sort of kills the Q equals two case. I mean, there's nothing really surprising here, right? I mean, all I'm saying is that, uh, you know, uh, uh, two local PRGs are completely insecure. In fact, it turns out that these two local PRGs are really horribly, horribly broken uh, in the following sense. Um, so this is a, a theorem of uh, Moses and uh, um, uh, Charikar and Wirth uh, from a long time ago. And reformulated in the sort of the crypto language, what that says is that uh, there is a polynomial time algorithm that distinguishes between um, uh, random strings and strings that are close to the image of the PRG. So really all I wanted to ask, all, I, all I'm asking for in a PRG distinguisher is to distinguish between random strings and strings in the image of the PRG. The charikar worth algorithm does even more. They actually distinguish between random strings and strings that are even close, half minus epsilon close to the image of, uh, of the Surano generator G. So if it's actually half, then it's really all strings, right? Uh, so you know um, things that are like even a little bit close to the image of the PRG, they can distinguish from truly random strings. And this they can do when uh, the stretch is like n over epsilon squared. It'll come up later. How, how does that Thomas? compare to uh, learning parity with noise? Like the this new um, wh why is this easy Good. and LPN is So these are two exhausts. These are two exhausts, right? Uh, effectively, oh. the the problem turns to two exhausts. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Which uh, yeah, I mean, if it were three, <laughs> this is again a two-three, right? Uh, then you know, I don't know an algorithm that uh, that does as well as this. Then it's essentially learning parity noise. Okay, so these guys are extremely, totally, totally broken. So what I want to do is I want to sort of extend these attacks to the large alphabet case, right? So and now I have two choices: either I can go into Moses' head and try to sort of understand what uh, what that what this what this algorithm means, or I can try to use Moses as a black box. So I prefer using Moses as a black box, <laughs> um, and that's what we are going to do. Our distinguisher for large alphabets will use the charikar worth distinguisher as a black box, and it'll make one call to the charikar worth distinguisher. Okay. So the way I'm going to do it, our main technique, is what I call alphabet reduction. So again, var various sort of forms of alphabet reduction were already around, but this one form, uh, you know, I haven't seen it uh, elsewhere. Again, I'm not a CSP person, but uh, yeah. So what we're going to do is we want to reduce breaking uh, blockwise to local PRG with alphabet size Q, large alphabet, to strongly breaking a two local PRG with alphabet two. Okay, so we know already how to strongly break. Strongly break meaning distinguish between random strings and strings that are even close to the output of the PRG. That we know how to do for a two local PRG with bits as input, with alphabets of size two. I want to say that I can bootstrap to breaking uh, blockwise to local PRG with large alphabet size. That's what I want. Okay, so how does it work? Well, here is the idea. Suppose for a moment that two conditions hold. Condition number one, um, you can look at each sort of block of the input and you can sort of, you know, partition them into sort of, you know, blocks that contribute to the first input of P, right? So you can look at each output there. You can say, well, does this block come up as the first input of P or the second input of P? Right? I can look at each input block and say, well, in this picture, the first block sort of is the first input in one case and the first input in the second case. Uh, the last block is the first input in one case and the second input in another case. So the question is, where does this block fit? Does it fit in the first slot of P or the second slot of P? Right? So the, a block could either be always contributing to the first slot of P or always contributing to the second slot of P or both, depending on which output it is contributes to. So I don't like those third guys. I want to say, you know, each input node only contributes to the first or the second slot of uh, of P, right? So how do I achieve this? Turns out that it's not so hard to achieve. You can throw away some of these offending input, uh, offending output bits, um, and you can sort of get these uh, get this condition to hold. So it's not a big it's not a big deal. The second condition is actually a big deal. It is it is with a lot of loss of generality. And the second condition says that the predicate P is decomposable. In the sense that the predicate P looks like, you know, computing a predicate P looks like taking the first input, applying a function to it, which maps to a bit, applying a function G to the second input also maps to a bit, and applying a predicate Q, a bit predicate, a bit, uh, sort of a one bit predicate 
to f of x and g of y. So that's what I mean by decomposable. So another way to sort of think about decomposability is that uh, q is, is, is that p is really a one-bit predicate in the closet. Right, so it really is a one-bit predicate. Um, I'm kind of like projecting my inputs down into one bit and secretly computing uh, a one-bit predicate on it. So that really is not without loss of general. Like there are very few predicates that actually look like this. Yeah, which is believable. Yes. So again, the first condition easy. Throw away some of the uh, some of the output bits, and it doesn't do uh, do us any harm because we are still we have a gap problem, right? It reduces the gap by a little bit, but not too much. So if condition two were true, let's see what happens. What is our attack strategy? Um, we're going to think about the PRG as sort of a, think about the mental experiment where computing the PRG goes in two steps. One, I take the input x and I map it into bits by applying either f or g, depending on whether the block contributes to the first slot of p or the second slot of p. Some do one, some do the other. Right? So these um, circles are actually bits. Some of these circles are obtained by applying f, some by applying g. Yeah. So the, computing the PRG is this two-step process. So really, I can think of computing the PRG as uh, Applying the the so the, the the PRG GHQ where Q is actually a, um, a bitwise um, uh, predicate on a string x tilde and x tilde happens to be uniform. So really, this PRG is a two local PRG the way we defined it before, and Charikar worth really sort of breaks it. In fact, it even strongly breaks it. Right. So if condition two were true, one and two were true, you're done. And he said condition one is true. You can you can make it true. Condition two is not true at all, right? So here is where alphabet reduction comes into picture. So it turns out, so the main lemma that, uh, that we have, I'll state the lemma and I'll give the intuition behind it. It turns out that every predicate P is close to another predicate P prime, which is actually decomposable. So again, I said, you know, not every predicate is decomposable, but every predicate is somewhat close to another predicate which is decomposable. And how close? Half plus one over square root q close, turns out. This is actually optimal. Right? So that actually lets us uh, go back to our sort of attack and actually make it work. So here is a, so how do we sort of show this, uh, you know, uh, this decomposability? Um, you know, it's really it turns out that this theorem, this uh, this main lemma, um, is a refinement of uh, uh, a lower bound result from the two source extractor literature. And really, this this lemma is a is a is a strange way to say that every two source extractor um, has a certain error. In other words, every two source extractor on n bits and n bits, even with min entropy n minus one on both sides, needs to have error at least two to the minus n over two rather square root of 2 to the minus n. And that's, you know, you know, if you look at it the right way, and if you sort of improve the parameters of this uh, sort of two-source extractor lower bound, you basically get this, uh, uh, get the main lemma. Does that make sense? So in, in other words, what I want to do is I want to think about the predicate as a table. Uh, x, the x indexes the rows of the table, and y indexes the columns of the table, right? So that's p of x, y. And what I want to say is that you can partition this uh, table into, uh, well, four parts. The first thing I do is I identify a subcube, uh, half by half, q over 2 by q over 2 subcube, that has uh, a non-trivial bias, where if you look at the, so the zeros and ones inside, the whole thing is biased towards 1 or 0, for that matter, uh, by half plus 1 over square root q. So there's non-trivial bias um, to either 0 or 1. And it turns out that from there you can actually sort of fill in the rest of the sort of the you know you can put, you can complete compute a full partition um, where um, you know um, two of these uh, uh, which has a sort of bias as I claimed essentially. So given this partition, uh, given this sort of kind of partition, what does Q what does P prime look like? Um, what does Q and F look like? F is a function that uh, sort of takes an, takes an input X 
and it outputs 0 or 1 depending on which row, which set of rows x indexes. So in this picture, if x in, is in the first three rows, f outputs 1. It says, well, you're in the blue part of the, so the rows. Um, and uh, um, if x is in the second half of the rows, the output 0. Same with y. Right? And now q only needs to know which set of rows I fall into to decide whether the output is 0 or 1. I'm hiding a few details under the rug, but really sort of what, what, what this is, is sort of identifying uh, a subcube, uh, a submatrix of, uh, of this sort of predicate matrix. This is, this is actually the truth table of the predicate, which has significant bias. So the trivial thing to do, the first thing you would think of if I, well, maybe you'd do better, but the first thing I would think of if I gave it to myself as an exercise is to come up with uh, a half plus one over Q bias. But that's actually trivial. Um, you can actually much, do much better than that. You can actually do half plus one over square root q. That's really what we need. OK, so, so this is the main lemma. Not hard to prove. In fact, it is really sort of a, a two source extractor lower bound in sort of a, in a couched in a, another form. Uh, and given this lemma, how does our attack work? Well, we're given a uh, predicate p, a uh, graph h for the pseudorandom generator and a target z, which is either pseudorandom or random. I'm going to compute, take this predicate P and H, and I'm going to compute Q, F, and G, which is basically the decomposition of P. Uh, and this I can compute, it turns out, in polynomial time, polynomial in Q time. Now I'm going to call the Charikar worth distinguisher uh, for Q with predicate Q, which is a one bit predicate, and with error parameter 1 over square root Q. So what happens is that if Z is actually uniformly random, I am actually feeding a uniformly random string to the Charikar worth distinguisher. If z is a random output of ghp, it's actually close to a random output of ghp prime, uh, which is basically the output of ghq. Right? And that the closeness is precisely the 1 half plus 1 over um, square root q. Right? So putting everything together, our epsilon is really like how much more than half your bias, and that's 1 over square root q. If you so if plug in n over epsilon squared becomes uh, n times q, and that's that's how we get the get the attack. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. So too bad, but uh, but one can ask, where does that leave us? I mean, are, is all hope lost? You know, do we have I/O? Uh, and as someone asked, do we have I/O from LWE? You know, uh, good. So I think I missed a question from Clement. This, why does the impossibility result for non block block local? Ah, so um, is it still a question um, given the analysis, or is, was it a question before the analysis? Good. So, oh, yeah, it was a question before, 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 before the analysis. Why can't you? Can't you I uh, use the previous thing that says that for like the non-block uh, PRGs, uh, you can't achieve that, knowing that now you just have basically binary inputs to GHQ to rule out uh, the existence uh, of yes, GHQ. Yes, yes. So, yes, so, 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 so you're saying we, uh, you were saying we can use the binary distinguisher to rule out this guy. Yes, I mean, if I, if I understand right. Are you asking how how the how can we rule it out? Good. So, so really, the key point here is the following. Um, I want to distinguish between random and something in the image of GHP, right? I claim that something in the image of GHP is actually not in the image of GHQ, not necessarily, but it's close to the image of GHQ. And the close actually is exactly uh, the sort of the uh, closeness between P and P prime. You know, P prime is the sort of the predicate that was decomposable, and it was approximately it was close to P, and that translates uh, over here. This needs a little bit of work, but um, not, nothing more than Chernoff founds uh, at this point. Good, so, so where does this leave us? I claim that there are two options, at least two options. Um, one is actually um, that uh, you know, this, this, this line that I left open in my table, which is, can you get PRGs, two blockwise local PRGs, which stretch n times q with a, some predicate, not a random predicate, with some graph, 
And uh, in fact, each output bit is computed with the different predicates of the input. So there it turns out that our lower bound does not go through. In fact, you need stretch n times q squared uh, for our lower bound to go through. So what can be done potentially is if you can show a candidate predicate with these parameters, and Rachel and Stefano uh, get their acts together and improve their theorem from n times requiring stretch n times q cubed to requiring stretch only n times q. So if both of these events happen, then you have uh, a candidate construction of uh, indistinguishability obfuscation. But I think of this as a very narrow, an exceedingly narrow possibility. OK, so if you don't want to think about uh, these parameters and CSPs and so forth, uh, a potentially easier way to go about it is to go ahead and build three linear maps. You know, uh, uh, so going from uh, you know, uh, one linear map to two linear map was a matter of going from number theory to uh, elliptic curves, which is algebraic number theory. Um, now, if you can do like uber algebraic number theory or algebraic geometry, hopefully we can construct three linear maps. Who knows? This is something that people are sort of actively pursuing at this, uh, this moment. Okay, so that's that's what uh, that's what it is. Good. So so let me sort of I want to sort of end with uh, saying this is really a sort of a curious case of uh, of indistinguishability obfuscation. Uh, this is sort of the difference between two linear and three linear maps. So you know the fact that there is a difference between two and three shouldn't be surprising to us. In fact, we see it all the time in uh, in computer science. But the fact that the different the, the difference between two local PRGs and three local PRGs is somehow related to the possibility of obfuscating programs, uh, you know, I still haven't quite gotten around uh, to, to really understanding what's going on here. Um, so it remains a mystery why this is the case right now, but why is this the case? I haven't quite understood. Uh, again, thank you for listening. Thanks, Vinod. Uh, I'll take questions. More questions. Let me ask one while everyone gathers their thoughts and gets to the microphone. So I, I was just curious, uh, because I think when you started, you mentioned that uh, there's a completely separate candidate conduct construction for IO based on different assumptions. Um, uh, how does that compare to the assumption that, uh, for example, three linear maps exist? Um, Is that so? Um, so eventually, all these constructions uh, go back to the assumption that uh, Multilinear maps exist, so three linear maps exist at this point. So we don't know of another construction. So okay, so but so, I so thought we, I, I thought you said there was oh, a candidate construction. So this is not an actual I, candidate construction, right? You're missing the PRG. Good, good, good. So, good, good, good. This is this is missing the PRG. So the one, only candidate construction that I think I mentioned is actually the original work of Garg, Gentry, Halevi, Rekova, Sai, and Waters. This this is sort of this is where they first constructed a candidate. Uh, this was all actually based on multilinear maps of some form. So here's the start. Here's the confounding status of uh, of uh, of this candidate. Um, uh, you can prove the security of these candidates from certain multilinear maps, sort of polynomial degree multilinear maps, or versions of it. Um, and you can instantiate these polynomial degree multilinear maps using sort of lattices in some way. So sort of, you know you have an approximate sort of multilinear map that uh, you can instantiate from lattices. Unfortunately, the DDH assumption on these approximate multilinear maps is false. It's just plain false. You can break it. But the obfuscation candidate itself remains unbroken. So, so, so these 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 multilinear maps are necessary okay. to construct obfuscation, um, right? Um, and they're broken. That doesn't mean anything about the obfuscation construction, which is not broken at this point. Um, so very. Uh, is it not broken because it's a complicated construction and people haven't quite gotten around to understand it? it's an obfuscated construction and uh, people haven't gotten around to understanding it? Or is there really something going on in the construction beyond multilinear maps? Is, is it deriving its security from some other source? Who knows at this point? Uh, you know, I, this is another confounding kind of state of affairs. Um, other questions? Okay, so, no so I should say that. Okay, go ahead. 
Yeah. So, so I should say the so the, the one thing that actually comes to mind that uh, sort of you know as an analogy is uh, is UGC, right? I mean, uh, you know, assuming UGC, you can derive sort of fascinating consequences. Uh, sometimes you can actually remove the UGC assumption and you can get sort of real NP hardness, which is again something that we have done in the I/O setting. You've constructed things from assuming I/O, and we have de-IOized these constructions. So we have actually sort of made these constructions work from sort of um, nicer assumptions. Um, but uh, you know, as important as UGC is to sort of, uh, theoretical computer science, I/O is, in fact, I would say even more important to cryptography. So I think you know, we, it, it it behooves us to kind of like you know, this is my pitch, this is my spiel to sort of recruit people to think about uh, I/O, its applications, construction, CSPs, whatever. So in the same direction, uh, you mentioned earlier you had there was some PRG construction and you had sort of some evidence that would be secure against SDP yes. attacks and things like that. Yes. So is it possible to have um, a formal treatment of uh, um, you know an IO scheme that would be secure against you know not polynomial or quasi polynomial time? Oh, I see. All sort of, but that Interesting. I mean that would have to encompass also Gaussian elimination, right? Because you wouldn't want to say my crypto scheme is secure. Yeah. If yeah, you know yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Um, yeah. That's right. That's right. So, so, so somehow you can, if you, you could treat both attacks kind of case by case, I suppose, right? I mean, one by one. The Gaussian you prove security against Gaussian elimination attacks, linear attacks, um, and then you prove security against these STP type attacks potentially. Um, the so the barrier is somehow that um, you know the reductions from uh, breaking I/O to breaking these multilinear maps uh, and and the PRGs. Um, you know, maybe they don't fit within the sort of the uh, the SDP uh, uh, framework, and then one has to really sort of think about it. But it's a possibility, right? Certainly. Thanks. So, if there's no more questions, um, I'll thank uh, Vinod again uh, for his talk. Thanks, thank Vinod. Uh, remind you all that in a couple of weeks we'll have uh, John Kellner uh, from MIT give the talk. And um, also, before we close, uh, let me thank everyone who's working uh, for TCS Plus uh, behind the scenes. So that's uh, Clément Canon, who was around uh, and had to leave, and India Day, Godam Kamat, uh, Ilya Rosenstein, and uh, Otto Gav. Uh, so thanks, everyone, and um, I'll take us offline. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.